Hello and welcome to another video. Uh, today we are going to be looking at a A2, so that's year 12, year 13, or all of um, the exam board, the syllabus, uh, micro paper. So paper one, markets and business behaviour, 2019, paper one, and all content across both years. As always, what I'm going to do is run through section A, go through it as quickly as possible, but explain my reasoning behind all of the questions uh, and answers and hopefully give you a better understanding of how to go through and get full marks in this section so that you can really boost your grades uh, for section B, section C and boost that overall mark for yourself. So as always, uh, for A2 papers, we have 30 minutes to complete section A, which means that <laughs> we will try and get through that as quickly as possible. I don't, I've never gone over the time, even with explaining all of my reasoning. So I will endeavour to do the same as well. OK, let's get started. So between 2016 and 2017, the average price of new build houses in the UK rose by an estimated 5.4%. And you've got all the information here, the year, the quantity of UK new house builds. Uh, with reference to the data provided, calculate the PES of supply for new house builds between 2016 and 17. If you advise to show your working. OK, so if I'm calculating the price elasticity of supply, I need to do the percentage change. In the quantity supplied over the percentage change in the price. So according to this, uh, the average price of new build houses rose by 5.4%. And the percentage change in quantity supplied, we can use this information here, the quantity of new UK house builds. Uh, so if I want to do this percentage change, in case you struggle with that, it's uh, new minus old, over old, and then times 100, with 2017 being the new value and 2016 being the old value. So if I plug that into my calculator, I do 162880 minus 134612 over 134612 times 100, um, and I would get 21%. Uh, if I put that into, 21 over 5.4, that gives me an answer of 3.9. And actually, often because of the estimation and rounding figures, and it's typically within the range, the answer, um, but 3.9 seems applicable. And it hasn't told us to round it to any particular amount. A 2.5% increase in new build house prices in one region of the UK causes a 10% increase in the number of houses built. Tetris Paribus, so this suggests that supply of new house builds is, again, then we've got all these different options, but let's actually just work that out quickly because that would be the easiest thing to do. Okay, so there's a 10% increase in the supply and there's a 2.5% increase in the prices, which means that the PES is four. So what that tells me is that it is relatively price elastic. So I know that the answer is going to be C. It's not perfectly price elastic because the value isn't equal to infinity. So this is going to be equal to infinity. It's not price inelastic because it's not less than one. Um, oh, sorry, perfectly price inelastic because it's not equal to zero. And it's not relatively price inelastic because it's not less than one. That's what I meant to say. So it's not, let's just put that and then like that, not equal to zero and it's not less than one. Explain one factor that is likely to determine the price elasticity of new house builds. Now, there is going to be a whole load of different things. So you could think about the availability of workers, the time period, the land that's available, uh, the raw materials that are available. All of those things are going to influence the way in which it's built. Technology, for example. So one factor influencing the Yes, of house builds, new house builds is the uh, supply of raw materials available. If they are difficult to obtain,
I don't know, due to some kind of shortage. Housing becomes more price inelastic. Housing supply becomes more price inelastic. Housing supply becomes more price inelastic. There we go. Okay. In August 2017, Hurricane Harvey caused the closure of nearly a quarter of the oil production capacity in the United States, in case it was influencing the supply of it. Uh, draw a supply and demand diagram show the likely microeconomic effects of the hurricane on the US oil market. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is just label my axes so I can make sure that I don't lose marks for that because there's four marks in total. Here is my demand. Here is my original supply. And there is my initial equilibrium. Because it's closed nearly a quarter of the oil production capacity, it's going to be an inward shift of supply. We're going to show Logically, you want to show that quantity is going down that way, that there's not as much oil that's been able to be produced. So here's my new supply curve. It's two. It doesn't really matter how far you shift it in. There's P2. The price of oil is going to be higher because it's there's less, fewer people who are making it. Um, and that's it. Yeah, you don't need to do anything else other than that. Maybe I could draw that, but it's not necessary. Okay, the diagram shows the movements from position X to Y on the production possibility frontiers. In which, in which one of the diagrams does the movement from X to Y illustrate the most likely impact of the US, on the US economy of a natural disaster such as Hurricane Harvey? Well, a natural disaster is going to wipe out any, like a quantity of factors of production and also and potentially reduce the quality of the remaining factors of production, which means that the production possibility frontier is going to be most likely shifting inwards to represent that. So the one that represents this is A. B is not correct. It shows it would show an improvement in the quality of the factor production, like some kind of improvement in technology or research or development. C is showing a change in the output of or a relocation, a redirection of goods towards consumer goods, but you would expect actually you would go the other way, going from Y to X, because the US would want to produce more capital goods to increase the production of whatever it might be like oil, uh, other capital equipment that was destroyed. And why is not correct to showing a, 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 a output that's beyond um, the actual output, a positive output gap, which is not going to be the case as well. Okay, question three, according to the Royal Mail, more hair and beauty salons opened on UK high streets last year than any type of independent business. Yeah. Um, with a net increase of 10% representing 626 new salons, the UK hair and beauty industry is an example of monopolistic competition because, okay, firms spend nothing on advertising and research. That's wrong. You can see that firms, um, UK hair and beauty industry do spend money on advertising for sure. Dominated by a few large firms is wrong. There's loads of independent barbers and independent hairdressers. The products are homogenous. No, that's not true. You can get different um, services when you go into a barber shop or a hairdresser's. And there are low barriers to entry and exit. There are relatively low barriers to entry and exit. There are some, but they are low. They're not expensive compared to opening like up a tech company, for example. Okay, draw a cost and revenue diagram to show the long run equilibrium of a firm in monopolistic competition. So what we want to do is show that they're profit maximizing, uh, but we want to show that they won't be making super normal profits due to the existence of a uh, low barriers to entry. So this is what we would do. Uh, we have revenue costs, yeah, quantity, and draw my marginal cost curve like so, and draw my average cost curve, and it intersects at the bottom here, and then it goes back up like so. That's important to illustrate. Um, I'm going to draw my average revenue curve going across like so. There's my average revenue and my marginal revenue. I'm going to change it so that it shows that they're making a uh, normal profit. OK, so if you have a, a firm oper operating with monopolistic competition in the long run, they'll be profit maximizing, uh, but they're not making super normal profit. So the profit maximization point is here. Profit max. Is where MR is equal to MC. 
So draw down from this point, that's the quantity that they will produce and the price that they will charge is represented there, P1. If they're not making super normal profit, if they were, the average cost would be below the average revenue line. Okay, done. So in 2016, uh, the insurance group Isha undertook a demerger with its Go Compare price comparison website. The most likely reason for this demerger was to a benefit from an external economies of scale. No, that's to do with firms outside of it and um, in, within the industry. Benefit from internal economies of scale. No, it's unlikely. Focus more on its core business. Sounds correct. Maybe they were getting distracted. There was diseconomies of scale from having too large of a business. Increase its market share is unlikely as well. So C is the correct one. In fact, D is not right because it's going to reduce market share because they no longer have access to the market through which um, they were utilizing previously. Okay, now following the demerger, Go Compare announced in 2017 a profit of 17.5 million, up 21.5% on 2016. Total revenue in 2017 was 75.8 million pounds, up 4.1% in on 2016. Calculate using the information provided the total costs of Go Compare in 2016. Okay, so total costs. Usually, when we're talking about total costs, we're saying fixed costs, that's variable costs. That in this case is not really relevant because we're not given we're not given fixed costs or variable costs. We can also find out that profit is total revenue minus total costs. And if we rearrange that, we know that total cost is equal to total revenue minus profit. So here we go, 2017. Uh, let's start off with profit because we need to go back to 2016 and 2016 revenue. So 2016, 2017, getting my numbers muddled up, but it's okay. We're still on the right track. 2017 profit was 17.5 million, but it was up 21.5%. So to find what it was in 2016, we need to divide it by 1.215. That represents 21.5% increase. If we do that, we should get 14.4 million. Okay, for prop for revenue, again, it was 75.8 million and it was up 4.1%. So we divide that by 1.041, and that represents 4.1% we do that, we shall get 72.8 million. Now, if I want to work out what my total cost is, then I take my total revenue, because we're going to fill in this bit here, total revenue, which is 72.8 mil, and minus my uh, total profit, which is 14.4 mil, and that should get me at 58.4 mil. That's the cost. Okay, formats, there's quite a lot of calculations, not too difficult. Um, just make sure that you know how to divide to go back in, uh, from a percentage increase. Question five, the last one. Okay, so. Free market economics is being challenged. The arguments for and against are being increasingly discussed with many countries. Explain how resources are allocated in a free market economy. Okay, well, in a free market economy, they're allocated according to the price mechanism, which is the intersection of demand and supply. It's putting. Price mechanism. Uh, okay, now we just get rid of this final bit there. I give an example. For example, because it's two marks, I'm worried that I won't get all the marks. For example, if demand for a good increases. The rationing function of the price mechanism
will increase the price to reduce the demand. There we go. Okay, which one of the following statements is true? Friedrich Hayek believed that the government should subsidize inefficient firms. No, Friedrich Hayek hated uh, inefficient firms or what he called zombie companies or companies that grew based off have uh, easy credit environments like in the two, before the 2008 financial crisis. Friedrich Hayek was a key advocate of command economy's way of allocating resources. No, he did believe in capitalistic uh, markets. Karl Marx advocated allocating resources by the free market. No, because he was he believed in uh, communism and socialism. Uh, Karl Marx criticized the private ownership of factory production. Yes, he did. Adam Smith described the benefits of specialization. Adam Smith described the benefits of specialization and the division of labor, explained one advantage to a firm of using division of labor when organizing its production process. Okay, so in division of labor, work has become more specialized at doing their roles. This increases efficiency of workers, reducing waste and reducing costs for the firm. Because the question says, what is the benefit, one advantage to a firm? So just making sure that we explain that at the end as well. Okay, that is all of section A done. Total there of 25 marks. Um, I believe that I've gone well under the allocated time of 30 minutes and have hopefully explained this all to you in a way in which it makes sense. If you have any questions, pop them into the comment section, let me know and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And I will come back with another video uh, in the near future. In the meantime, many thanks um, and good luck with any exams or uh, any learning that you have going on at the moment. Thank you.